example from last year. And I'm sure you're looking forward to hearing them sharing their past experiences. And just before we begin, I know we're very used to Zoom over the last couple of years, but a reminder, please, just about keeping yourself muted for the duration of this presentation. We will have time for questions at the end of the session. So if you do have any questions or queries as these slides proceed, um, please do hold on until that session at the end, and then you can raise your hand and ask your question. Or if you want to, you can insert your question into the chat box and one of the Secretariat members can find your question and read it out for you. And also just to say, if you're someone who would rather ask a question in private, that's perfectly fine as well. You can contact the Secretariat on our email address which will be outlined on one of the slides later on in the presentation. So we just move to the next slide, please. And just to provide you then quickly with a overview of what we're hoping to cover in today's session. We're really going to look at um, what is the Potova model UPR, and then we will cover the eligibility criteria, the application process, the timelines that are involved for both um, where we'll look at the training program that is provided to selected participants of the model. And then we will hear, as I said, from three past participants who are serving on the Secretariat for this year. And then we will conclude with a question and answer session. Um, so next slide, please. So I suppose first and foremost, um, because we do know different students will have different knowledges and understandings of what the Universal Periodic Review or the UPR is. And it's important to understand what this mechanism is in order to understand why the part of a model is so unique and so exciting for students. Mm -hmm. So what you may or may not know is that the UPR, as we refer to it, is a mechanism, it's a very unique process that really entails a periodic review of the human rights records of all 193 UN member states. And as I said, it's a very innovative mechanism of the Human Rights Council, and it's based on that principle of equal treatment for all countries. And it really provides an opportunity for member states to provide an account of their human rights record in their own countries and provide an opportunity for other states to provide recommendations for how to improve on the human rights situation in their countries. And also very importantly, the mechanism provides an opportunity for domestic NHRIs to provide an account of the main issues and the human rights concerns in the respective countries and to identify good practice. And also international NGOs as well as domestic um, NGOs can also feed into that monitoring and evaluation process. So essentially, the UPR is a very multi-stranded evaluation procedure and it's the only mechanism of its kind that's currently in existence and as you can probably ascertain the ultimate aim is really to improve the human rights situation in every country it's designed to prompt support and expand the promotion and protection of human rights within countries um, by that assessment procedure so when we have next slide please so what is the part of the model UPR? It's really just a very unique academic simulation of the UPR process. And it's organized by a team of students from on an international basis, um, as well as former delegates under the guidance of academics and staff at the Human Rights Center at Padova University. And um, we're delighted that the model is supported by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, which very uh, kindly does provide a judge or evaluator for the purposes of the simulation. So the model process then really provides you as participants with a chance to develop your knowledge and understanding of that really unique mechanism and the dynamics and the relations that are present during the process. Um, because it gives you the chance to adopt the role yourself. So you can have the role of a state, um, of an NGO or an NHRI throughout the entirety of the simulation, and you need to act out those roles. And the more effective you act out those roles, the more exciting and enriching the process is. So as you can probably ascertain, it's very interactive and it's very staged. And if we can have the wee video played, please, just to give you more of an insight.
thank you very much for playing that video. Um, it's currently the video that the Secretariat have released to help encourage um, awareness of the model and to encourage applications, which we'll discuss later on in this session. So thank you. Can we move on to the next slide, please? So as I said previously, the part of the model provides you as participants with that opportunity to adopt a very um, interactive and simulating representative role in an interactive academic simulation. So the part of a model UPR is a de facto simulation of the UPR process. And as you could probably ascertain, it's interactive, it's engaging, and you're very much encouraged to fully immerse yourself in the role which you have been um, given for the purposes of the programme. So as part of the process, you can apply to represent either a state under review or a state delegate, an NHRI or an international INGO. And as I've said previously, we do have past participants who can speak more fully on what it's like to have those roles and what their experiences were in holding those roles. And for this year, um, the states that will be under review are Azerbaijan, Cameroon, Canada, Colombia, France and Nigeria. And then obviously the domestic NHRIs of each respective country are also open to applications for teams who wish to serve in that representational role. And we also have some very exciting um, list of INGOs as well, which include Friends of the Earth International, the Frontline Defenders, the Global Initiative to End All Corporal Punishment of Children, the International Working Group for Indigenous Affairs, Minority International, and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. So essentially, when you take on one of these roles, you're committing to that role for the purposes of the full simulation. And that means that you will need to conduct research into how those um, organizations or those institutions truly work in order to make the simulation as um, close to reality as possible. But you won't be alone in learning how to do that. So next slide, please. Um, you will be provided with a training process. Um, for those who are selected to participate in the part of the model 2022, there is a comprehensive training program provided, which will equip you with the skills and the knowledge in order to immerse yourself in the program, to have the real benefits of the program and to enjoy yourself in that representative role. There will be three training sessions. And as you can see on the slide, um, they'll be delivered across the dates of the 10th to the 21st of October and from the 7th to 11th of November. Each session will be between an hour and a half to two hours duration. And we're very thankful to have the opportunity to bring you also very special guest speakers who will then deliver um, special sessions after those training programs and hopefully give you a more full account of what it really is like to serve in these roles as an NHRI or an INGO in real life, essentially, that then can inspire you to um, really hold on to your role during the simulation. And um, as you can probably guess, it's obviously very important that you do commit to attending the training programme in order to be as prepared as possible for the entirety of the simulation. And um, whenever you are successful in your application to the programme, you will be added to the university's Moodle platform. So you will have access to resources, including forums online, as well as the comprehensive training programme. So I will now hand over to my colleague, um, Jimena, to walk you through the application process and their criteria that you need to know to put in your application form. Thank you, Leah. Uh, well, now that you heard what this is all about, uh, you might be considering, uh, but why should you apply? I think this opportunity gives you a lot of new skills and new uh, opportunities to practice these skills, such as teamwork and um, academic writing and research and so on. So it also helps you develop knowledge and understanding of the UPR and uh, international human rights law in general. And I do think it broadens your career opportunities if you're thinking of working in the human rights field. And yeah, it's a very unique model. It's not, uh, it's not done anywhere else. So it, um, it really helps you move forward with this path. Next slide, please. Okay, so here are some of the participation criteria. Um, we really encourage people from all paths to join. Uh, this is open for university students. 
So if you're a bachelor student that has completed two years of your degree or a master or PhD student with an interest in knowledge in human rights, this is for you. If you have studied political or social sciences or international relations or legal studies, um, you would be the perfect fit. Uh, but if you come from a different background and you are just changing now into human rights, then you shouldn't be discouraged. Last year, I was working with um, a girl that studied arts first for her bachelor's. And it was really nice to have someone with a different background because they come with a fresh uh, mindset, I would say. Um, well, we look for people that already have a bit of knowledge on the UPR process. If you don't have it right now, it's not an issue. You have plenty of time to dig in a little and just have an idea of how the mechanism works so you're not too lost on the days of the simulation. Uh, we do ask for a very good command of English. But the whole session is held in English. There's a lot of things to write and um, you have to speak in the moment. So it's, it's good to have a good command of the, the language. And well, applicants have to be above the age of 18. Um, next, please. Uh, what should you consider? Well, we ask for team applications. So a team that will work as a state under review or a team that will work as an HRI or an NGO. Um, so yeah, please submit uh, your applications as a team. Participation is free of charge. So uh, there's no fee regarding the participation. Uh, you do need to look into travel and accommodation by yourself um, if you're not from Palova. But you should consider if you're not from the university um, to contact your own university because it's very likely that they can help you with some kind of support. Um, if you need some kind of letter to approve your participation, please let us know and we can provide you with that. And if you are from the University of Padova and you don't live in Padova, uh, the university can provide you with some kind of uh, financial aid. So also contact us for more information if this is something you would like to get. Um, next, please. So regarding the application process, uh, applications are already open and they will close on the 1st of October. And like I said, you should apply in teams. You have plenty of time to find your team. They can be from your university or not. It, uh, it does not matter. Uh, if you don't know people that are uh, interested in this, well, there's a few people here today that could potentially want to be your teammate. Um, we are considering in the future holding some kind of forum so you guys can meet other people if needed. Um, but if, if this is one of the reasons you're being discouraged to apply because you haven't found enough people for a team, do let us know. We will try to, to help as much as possible. We don't want this to be a, a reason not to participate. Um, so eventually you can apply on our website. We will provide you with the link uh, because we'll give you the slides later on. Um, and then you just have to scroll down, find the apply button. And there they will ask you for a bit of information on each of the team members and an overall, like an overview of your team and uh, your interests on human rights. So you will also need to um, select one team leader. It's just leader in the sense that we will be handling the communication with just one person of the team. Um, not much further, um, how do you say, it? not much further responsibility. Uh, so the, um, once we decide uh, on the teams that will participate, we will let you know on the 4th of October. And you would need to confirm your participation by the 7th. Um, and while well, teams will be considered on the basis of the shared experience in relevant fields, in your teamwork experience, and on your knowledge of the UPR. Hence why we um, encourage you to look into it before. Yeah, uh, thanks. So now we will move on to hear some of the experiences from previous participants. Uh, Alessia will talk about the experiences of state, uh, Derry as an NHRI, and Yumani will talk about her experience as an IGO. Uh, Alessia, you may take the floor. Thank you so much, Jimena. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Okay, um, hello everyone. Um, my name is Alessia. I participated as a state delegate in the last UPR. Um, I represented India as a state under review, and I'm here today to share my thoughts. So um, what it's like to represent a state under review. So to me, it was a very enriching experience, but challenging as well, because I had to go in depth in terms of research to understand my country's national framework, legislation and human rights records to represent it to the best of my abilities. 
And I also had to be prepared to answer possible comments, questions, and make remarks. So I had to build confidence to do that. But it really improved my um, communication skills in, in giving speeches. Um, I was also asked to decide which recommendations to accept or note and give an objective and logical reasoning that supported those choices. Um, so I had to ask myself, why should my country accept a recommendation? Why not? You know, does my country already have an effective system in place? Will my country be able to implement the recommendations with the resources it possesses? It seems easy, but it's, it's not because there are a lot of factors to ponder. Um, and then my creativity and analysis were strengthened um, since I had to make predictions on how the situation will evolve in the future. So be creative in describing plans and then programs and how my state managed to create the conditions for implementation. So what has been achieved, what's not, and so on. So it was a really great experience for me. But um, what about playing a recommending state? So in this case, you are recommending and not only analyzing other states' human rights records, but also um, creating specific strategies for improvement when you're putting forward the um, recommendations that the state should later implement. So you need to be familiar with the human rights issues going on in other countries and listen to um, NGOs' perspectives on the matter and, and understand um, the geopolitical context and of course recommend on those bases. So um, representing a state, I would say that really gave me a broader perspective on what is happening in the world in countries that are not usually covered much in our studies. And the approach to me was very, very professional because I learned about the functioning of the main procedures, but also became familiar with treaty bodies, international conventions, protocols. And, you know, I was asked to review and produce documents like the National Rapper, the Addendum, just like functionary of states do. So personally speaking, my background is in diplomacy and international relations. So I felt like a real ambassador. I, I felt it was like my job and I needed to do it right. And as far as I'm concerned, ends on experience is always the best um, to learn. And last year, we also had the privilege to welcome experts in our special events. And we met Nazar Shamin Khan, and she is the permanent representative of Fiji in Geneva and was the former president of the Human Rights Council in 2021, so last year. And we had the privilege to ask her questions. So it was so inspiring to me and really useful, not just for my academic background, but for my personal um, cultural baggage as well. So, um, yeah, I wish you all good luck with your application if you're considering applying. That's my personal experience. And now I will give the floor to Derry, who will illustrate what it's like to um, represent an NHRI. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Alessia. Um, I hope you can all hear me okay. I think maybe my Wi-Fi is slightly slow, but let me know if there's too many problems. Um, with hearing me. But hello everyone, um, my name is Derry and I'm a first year student here in Padova um, and I participated last year um, in the model UPR um, with a national human rights, uh, representing a national human rights institution or national human rights commission. Um, mine was for India. Um, for those who aren't aware, national human rights commissions are statutory bodies and national bodies and they're formulated with the aim of protecting human rights within a state. So, as I said, mine was within India. Um, this was also an institution that I learned about and uh, learned how it worked through participating in this UPR. Um, as prior, I also wasn't aware on, um, on the role of a national human rights commission. Um, 
so yeah now I will briefly talk about what I actually did uh so yeah once I was I applied as an individual which was an option last year um although uh this year it will just be as a group uh, and then I was paired up uh with the other girl who I worked with and um, we worked together to uh build and well to investigate and build a broad knowledge of the human rights uh situation in India um and to create a report on on this um, and to condense down what were the most important, what were the most pertinent issues, uh, working with other national human rights institutions um, that were also participating in the UPR from different states that year. Um, and with this report, we then presented it at the UPR. Um, prior to taking part in this, I had no, um, I had no previous experience um, in taking part in any model UN or model UPR. Um, and neither had I even started classes in Padova here yet. Um, but I knew I wanted to become more involved in the university and in the Human Rights Centre. Um, and so it's something I would really encourage, even if you have never had an opportunity to do anything like this before. Um, there's plenty of time, plenty of training. And if you have the motivation to put in the effort, um, it all becomes clear along the way. And we are all um, accessible to ask questions to if anything is not clear along, along the way. Um, and as for advice, finally, that I would give um, to people who will start next year, uh, the first thing would be to uh, be aware fully of the dates that um, that the training and the UPR will take place, uh, the model UPR, um, and to ensure that from the outset that you will be available um, to take part in them. Um, just because it's such a valuable experience and with one person or in a team perhaps not able to participate the same as the rest, um, it does make it feel a bit like unequal work and it can hamper your team's effort um, and it can have a, a negative impact on the simulation days. Um, my second piece of advice, as I kind of alluded to, would be to take the opportunity, even if you feel a bit nervous about it or you have never um, you never considered taking part in anything like this before because that's the position I was in last year and I would strongly recommend it. And uh, with that in mind, also the opportunity that it gives you if you are a student coming to study here uh, in Padua to meet people beforehand through joining up in a team um, and then taking part in the UPR. It's a great opportunity to get to know people here in Padua and to meet like-minded people. Um, so yeah, I hope that that was all helpful about my experience. Um, and I will now pass on uh, finally, but obviously if there are any questions at the end, um, you can let us know. Hi everyone, um, I'm Humani, uh, and I'm going to share a little bit about my experience um, in the Padua model UPR last year, representing uh, an international non-governmental organization. Um, I represented Freedom House. Uh, along with my colleague who's also uh, in this, I think, conference, Kalpani. Um, we're both from the University of Southeastern Norway, so we're not, uh, we were not uh, students at Pado University, but when we came across this opportunity, we were really eager to take part in something that's so hands-on and also so practical, uh, because I think that's important as human, anyone who's interested in the field of human rights uh, to be aware of. And I think Kalpani would resonate with me on that. Um, so what is different uh, in terms of playing a role of an INGO compared to what Alessia and Derry shared? Uh, it's a bit different because the unique position as a persuasive actor um, in the whole recommendation process. So you have to sort of understand uh, where you stand with the states and the NHRIs. The role of the INGO is quite different. Um, but also uh, at the same time, it requires similar amount of work. Um, one, I think, what was it? What was it uh, about playing an INGO that really um, made me identify some of the skills that required that would potentially help uh, the participants or, or like participants, participants who want to take part this year? Um, is one um, to identify the mandate of the INGO. While it's important, uh, you know, I'm not going to repeat on what um, how important research is and what kind of commitment you need to put in because my the speakers already um, before me shared insights on that. But I think it's important to identify the mandate of the INGO because to understand the role that you have to play in the whole recommendation process. Um, so you know, busting the myth that it's just for states and NHRIs, you also need to understand that 
as key stakeholders, INGOs also can play a very persuasive role in pushing for recommendations on key human rights violations. Um, so research then becomes really important to identify what kind of issues that you uh, need to be aware of, especially with regard to the state's concern, um, and also states who are reviewing, uh, because then you, you need to be sort of playing the role of an intermediary in bridging your mandate and the key issues and you know, the interest areas of the states to make sure that the recommendations that your organization or the organization that you represent is pushed forward in the UPR process. Um, I know it sounds a lot like a lot now, but it you know it works out as uh, the stimul uh, you know as you work on it, it kind of works out. Um, so being creative uh, is super important because sometimes you're put on the spot uh, because the organization that you represent, for instance, we represented Freedom House. We were the Freedom House as an organization pushes a mandate on freedom of expression, uh, and I, they're, they're moving on um, to talk about right to information and things like that. And we had different other issues that states uh, had pushed up in, in the stimulation process. So we had to kind of figure out how our mandate fits within the broader set of issues that UPR, the 2021 UPR was discussing. Um, so you have to be creative and that requires a lot of critical thinking and thinking on the spot, um, you know, just to make sure that your role is that much more worthwhile in the whole stimulation process and you understand what you can contribute to um, the stimulation. Uh, my biggest takeaway as an INGO representative was that it's very exciting. Um, so while it is a lot of work, it's still very exciting because you are playing a unique role. So don't underestimate uh, your role as an INGO if you're chosen or if you choose to do something like that. Um, just make sure that you stay updated about the human rights issues that your organization is covering. At the same time, human rights issues that um, is you know, brought forward by the states uh, who's involved in the stimulation process. Uh, and I can't stress enough the importance of reading the rules of the game. So the handbook gives us like the best friend. Uh, if you're ever unsure of anything, just go to the handbook. That's, I think that was one of the key recommendations that I can give. Um, and it's important to be, you know, maybe if, in, if you are still on thinking about whether or not to apply, maybe work on your mm, persuasive communication and writing skills. Um, in this, in the process of getting ready for the UPR, um, if you have a team member already that you have in mind, just um, it helps in the long run uh, when you are working uh, with the MUPR. Um, and at the same time, uh, working as a team, I can't stress how important that how important that is. Um, I think a lot of issues uh, that we cover. Uh, require a lot of research skills, a lot of you know communication between teams and um, within the team. So teamwork makes the dream work. So I have to say I had a really amazing team member and we work uh, around the clock and you know there was unavoidable circumstances that were challenging to us, but we still kind of continued to be a united front and you know with, with a broader objective of taking part in the UPR. So if you're still uh, on the fence as opposed to whether you're joining or not, I would highly recommend you to consider um, because it really, really was a worthwhile journey for both of us, me and my team member, uh, because we learned the practical aspect of um, human rights, how human rights issues uh, can be taken up in um, like global forums like United Nations. Um, so with that, I am going to um, pass on uh, the mic to, I think, Leah and Jamina to continue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our past three participants for sharing your experiences. And I have to say, I felt some nostalgia um, myself as a past participant, hearing you three recount your experiences. Um, which was excellent, thank you. So just to move on then to some final remarks before we open our question and answer part of this session. Just a reminder that the application to apply for this year's part of a model UPR is open. And as my colleague Humana has mentioned, you can access the application form online. Um, we will be providing these slides to all registered attendees after this session. So don't worry if you didn't get a chance to take note of the link, that link will be provided for you. 
Also, if you have any questions or queries um, as you approach the application forum with your fellow team members, please do not hesitate to contact the Secretariat. We obviously cannot complete the form for you, but we're happy to provide any clarification about certain sections or certain questions, um, because sometimes it can be a bit daunting to see a lengthy application form, and we understand that. But if you take your time um, going through section by section with your team members, it can be completed. But we are also here on hand if necessary. We do have a timeline there for you um, at the bottom of the slide. Um, we do want to just emphasize again that these applications will be reviewed on the basis of a team structure. So please do not apply as an individual. You have plenty of time, um, as has been alluded to, to find friends who'd be interested to form a team for you. Um, we are only able to assess team applications. Um, and then we will communicate the decision around the process, the outcome of your application on uh, the 4th of October. And we do ask that if you are selected to please kindly confirm your participation by the 7th of October, because we obviously will need to put steps in place to ensure the training programme is open and accessible and that you can all be registered on Moodle to start the preparations for the simulation in November.